One of the clearest signs of high level hoopers, especially more ball dominant guards, is how well they change pace. So being able to slow down, speed up, and everything in between, and then doing that in super creative ways. As well as playing at a more comfortable, composed speed overall, there's something that every hooper should work on and add in their game. And the best part is this doesn't have to be Kyrie level where you're using a bunch of moves, you're beating stationary defenders in ISO situations, but even in very simple situations, being able to manipulate your pace is one of basketball's most effective tools, especially in today's modern game. So in this video, I'll talk about one, all the different ways to use pace to your advantage, and then two, what skills you need to develop to actually apply all this. Let's get it. So first, let's dive into a pretty exhaustive list of ways that you can change pace to your advantage. With number one being just a simple float dribble. It's basic, but it's used probably 50 plus times a game by many guards. And as you float the ball and slow down here, the major advantage you get is a window to read defenders. So this starts with on-ball defenders, of course, as you see all of these guys letting that ball hang, relaxing a bit, and giving themselves a bit of time to process and make the best decision to drive, shoot, counter, whatever. And if you do this the right way, you're kind of forcing them to make a decision. For example, how Crawford buys time here. The defender must make a decision to either stay up or sit back, which ends up being a retreat and leaving the jumper open. Or how Maxi makes his defender choose to jump the screen or stay there and ends up rejecting the screen nicely after this float. This read happens super quickly and preferably isn't something you think about in game, but as you get experience with it, it becomes second nature, almost like a reflex, and this is something you see all the time. Also note that this works for off-ball defenders too, something we'll talk about in the pick and roll portion. And finally, as you're floating the ball, it helps you buy some time to find a nice foot position to explode from, like how Nash comfortably splits his feet mid-hang here to explode out. Number two is lulling defenders to sleep. This can be slowing down to give the defender the feeling that you're going to relax a bit and causing them to take a quick break mentally and in terms of lifting up out of their stance and then quickly going from there. This can take a couple dribbles, so really slowing down and coming to a full stop, but also it doesn't have to be a super long process. Like you see with Schroeder just kind of slowing down mid dribble here to quickly lull that defender to sleep and then exploding out. But regardless, if you can get defenders to lack for even half a second and then catch them off guard, it ends up in some of the best opportunities to blow by defenders. Finally, this could be lulling a defender to sleep for a jumper by changing pace, going a bit slower, and then quickly pulling from there. Next one, and one we rarely talk about, is changing speeds off the catch. I see a lot of players who, when they attack closeouts like this, go one speed, fast. But slowing down, getting into a super composed pump fake, and then speeding up from there is usually the best option to one, get defenders to actually fall for it, and two, allow them to close out even further to you so you have more of an advantage when you go. Like here, if Jones goes right away, this defender has more space to work with to recover. But since he slows down, the defender gets closer, and now it's an easy advantage. And it helps avoid those super quick travels off the catch, as well as making the jumper following the pump fake way more composed. Next is pick and roll, where I think way too many players come off ball screens like a chicken with their head cut off, rather than slowing down and letting plays open up. So here's the thing, pick and rolls take time to develop. When you come off a ball screen, slowing down allows time for that big to roll, which then makes it a 1v2 for this defender, rather than a 1v1. So now it's much tougher for them, and it's just about making this read. And while there are times to hit bigs early in their roll, it's also clutch if you slow down, allow them to get deeper into their roll, closer to the basket, and then hit them for a dunk versus super far away. Then, since the big is rolling, this tag defender will eventually have to make a decision to step over and stop them or stay home on their man, which again, takes a little bit of time to develop, but once they make this decision, it's yet another 1v2 to exploit. But if you come off at a crazy high speed, this never happens. Plus, if you have an advantage, in other words, your initial defender is behind you, you really have no need to rush. It can feel like it because it seems like they're chasing you, but the players who play with the best pace are the ones who are super comfortable just keeping them in jail, using positioning to stay in front, and therefore playing at a pace that keeps them more in control and maintains this 5v4 advantage that they now have. And the same thing goes for transition too, which is the next one. Like you see Larkin do here, rather than making it a race, sometimes it's best to slow down, use positioning to keep that defender out of it, and be much more in control than just racing to the bucket. And overall, it's just smarter to take fast breaks at a slower pace sometimes, especially once you have an advantage with your team, just to make sure you're able to see the entire floor and make composed decisions. Also notice how valuable changes of pace can be mid-drive. Or in other words, 
as you're on that sprint to the basket. Like here, Nash is attacking, his defender's kind of with him. So he quickly slows down to put his defender on his heels. And now he has a much bigger advantage. It can be super subtle like this or exaggerated like this. But regardless, it's a great way to throw off defenders if you don't have a huge advantage. Another underrated way to use change of pace is on finishes, which not only gives you better control on your touch and with contact when you slow down and attack a bit slower around the paint, but is also an amazing tool to deceive defenders. We're starting to see a ton of usage with these slow steps recently and for good reason. When you're attacking the basket with speed and slam on the brakes, it's hard for defenders to stop in time to contest that optimally. And similar to the hang dribble here, when you slow down, it also buys you time to make the best decision and find space. Lastly here is slowing down in the short zone, so probably about 5 to 15 feet from the bucket. Once you get in this area, the defense obviously tends to collapse pretty aggressively, so it gives you time and control to make a pass, but also to work out of a pivot and score the basketball. And honestly, of course, every player has a different style, but I believe most players' average speed should be lower than it is. Obviously, going at higher speeds is valuable at times, but I also believe that many younger players, especially, tend to be in a rush and probably go too fast on average. Whereas playing at an overall slower pace allows you to be more in control to shoot, pass, finish, make a move, whatever. You're able to see the floor better and not get tunnel vision. And then actually have higher gears to get into when you do take off and go faster. And I think we overestimate how fast we have to play to get to the bucket. For some players, that's their biggest advantage, so playing a bit faster may be the way to go. For the vast majority though, it's not. And it'll be more about finding situations where you can get an advantage without making it a race, and if anything, using speeds creatively to beat defenders. Like, none of these guys are rushing or racing, and they're doing just fine getting to the tent. This is what we want to get to. Okay, so now we have an understanding of how to use pace to our advantage. Now we'll talk about the library of skills you gotta develop to actually put all this to use. First is the ability to relax and slow down from a high speed, which is honestly tougher than expected. Yes, it takes being able to decelerate from high speeds, raise up your level or center of mass quickly, but also almost tougher than anything, it takes being able to go from a really explosive nervous system state into a more relaxed, calm one, like turning on and off a switch in your nervous system. And this has to be trained. And then of course the ability to get back into a higher speed from a relaxed one, kind of with your first step. This takes creativity with your footwork, so being able to get into these nice shin angles from an upward stance. Quality of change of speed is being able to explode from like upright positions, because most times if you're slow, you're upright. So being able to explode from somewhere like this is tough, but it's something to work on. So let's say you're literally, you're here, you're going like split stance, split stance. Whenever I step, you're exploding past me, even if you're in the middle of switching in a weird place, you're figuring out with your feet and go. Flow, let that ball float. Not bad. And a lot more that we could really dive into when we talk first step. Then it's about being able to cover the whole spectrum of speeds. If you're only able to go from zero to 100, it's a good start, but being able to go from maybe 20% speed to 70% speed to 40% speed, then up to 100% is where that next level value lies. 10, 80, 100, 80, 50, 10, 30. Then it's being able to explode out of weird positions. I briefly mentioned this footwork side of things. For example, here, if you're rotated, if your feet aren't set, if they're in an awkward position, whatever, this is super important to be able to capitalize on opportunities we get from lulling defenders to sleep or going at a slower pace. Now, this is important. The limiting factor in a lot of this is being able to comfortably float the ball, of course, without carrying. Because you can be relaxed as possible, but if the dribble still looks like this, you won't really be able to change pace in the truest sense. If you can't float the ball in your hand like this, because every dribble is like this, you inherently cannot change pace very well. That's, that's your limiting factor. I've worked with some players who literally, like, every dribble move is kind of the same speed and that limits them from being able to do certain things, right? And this is why I think although so many ball handling drills are focused on speed, and that's valuable too, working on being able to float the rock and slow down the dribble is just as important. And then of course, going between speeds and going from one to the other. Another control component is being able to use different hand positionings or motions to push the ball out of a float dribble. So being able to manipulate the ball in any position is big time, and it makes it possible to explode with any timing. Then, and this is a topic for another time, is making reads out of this. A lot of this just comes with playing a lot and working on change of pace while you do this with live defenders. 
Second to last is creativity. So being able to change pace in a multitude of ways, different timings, positionings, moves, whatever. And this makes you crazy unpredictable and tough to pick up on defensively. And last is composure, which may be the most important one. Not getting sped up by aggressive defenders or by the speed of the game and just playing at your pace. A ton of players have all these tools, but when it comes game time, they just can't apply it because they get sped up. So working against aggressive defenders consistently is a surefire way to develop the experience and the feel necessary for this. So hopefully you have a better feel of not only how to change pace, but also a roadmap as to what to train so you can get to the point where you are doing this in a game consistently. If you actually want a specific blueprint for this, we have an entire library of virtual academy programs, small guard essentials, two ball handling programs, and more. They're going to help you build these tools. As always, thank you guys for the support. See you next time.